Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. As soon as a person dies, decomposition begins, and the first visitors arrive. Within 5 to 15 minutes of death, blowflies or other insects begin to colonize the body. Rabi Musa, an organic chemist at the University of Albany. She says different species turn up at different stages of decomposition. So because of that, uh, depending upon what entomological evidence you find, you can learn something about when the person died in terms of the timing of the death. Flies don't tend to stick around when disturbed, by detectives, for example. But they do leave behind eggs. The eggs are hard to tell apart by appearance alone, so forensic entomologists rear them until they hatch a few weeks later, and they get a species ID and, with a little guesswork, a person's time of death. But Musa has come up with a less time-intensive approach, chemical analysis of the eggs. She and her team investigated that method by first harvesting flies with pig liver traps stashed throughout New York City. So it turns out that it's easy to hide uh, pig livers in in various uh, uh, parks and whatnot in Manhattan. There's a lot of foliage and and whatnot, and so they're easy to hide. So uh, no one knew. They collected the trapped flies and then chemically analyzed their eggs. And it turns out each species of fly egg has a unique chemical fingerprint, enough to tell the bugs apart without raising the eggs to maturity. And in a useful twist, the technique uses eggs preserved in alcohol, eggs that wouldn't be viable for rearing live insects anyway. The study's in the journal Analytical Chemistry. Musa and her colleague Jennifer Rosati are now testing the method on a real case. Once we do that, we will be publishing some case studies to illustrate that this is a method that can be used, and hopefully eventually it's something that will stand up in court. And something that could speed up detective work, or help revive a cold case. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. What sort of scenery do you find most appealing? Researchers in the UK asked volunteers that question through an online photo rating game, and the result was sort of what you'd expect. It's like the beautiful mountains, you know, the abundant greenery, beautiful like water features like lakes and oceans. Chanuki Saracena, a data scientist at the Warwick Business School. She says the more surprising finding was that human-built structures like churches and towers and cottages could enhance the perception of the beauty of a scene. And big expanses of green grass, like athletic fields, didn't actually rate that highly. But what they did next is where the data science comes in. They fed a computer 160,000 photographs rated through the online game. And they taught the machine to break each image into the scenic elements it contained, like snowy mountains and waterfalls, crosswalks and construction sites. And then they presented the computer with a challenge. They asked it to rate the scenic beauty of other photos it had never seen before. And it actually did pretty well at estimating the average crowdsourced consensus of beauty. The studies in the journal Royal Society Open Science. As smart as it is, the scenery-loving computer probably won't be putting tour guides out of business. Actually, I think it can help tour guides because uh, what's interesting is that I think it can uh, actually maybe uncover places that we didn't necessarily know about that might have not been that popular. And Saracena says the system might also help city planners more objectively evaluate the scenic beauty of new urban developments. We can also now look at, you know, how we might be able to design cities that people find more beautiful and people might want to actually spend more time in. Assuming, that is, the computer doesn't become truly intelligent and, like humans, starts spitting out subjective opinions entirely its own. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. We all know money can't buy happiness. But according to a recent study, there may be a loophole. A team of researchers finds that shelling out for services that save time can bring greater feelings of life satisfaction than, say, simply buying more stuff. The results appear in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's safe to say that most of us often feel crunched for time. So much so that we're experiencing what Ashley Willens of the Harvard Business School the lead author of the study, describes as a time famine. And like any famine, this chronic lack of time takes its toll on our health. When we feel like our to-do lists are longer than the hours that we have time in the day to complete them, we can feel as if our life is spiraling out of control, thereby undermining our personal well-being. Well, if time is money, 
Quillins and her team wondered whether money that's used to buy time could offer some relief, like paying someone else to clean the house, mow the lawn, or deliver the groceries. To find out, the researchers asked more than 6,000 people from the U.S., Canada, Denmark, and the Netherlands to rate their overall satisfaction with life and to estimate how much money they lay out each month to outsource unenjoyable daily tasks or otherwise purchase some time off. And they found that respondents who willingly swap funds for free time also report feeling more content, regardless of their income or how many hours they work each week. To follow up, the researchers conducted a smaller experiment in which they gave volunteers 40 bucks to buy a little something for themselves. The same participants got another $40 that they were told to spend on something that would save them time. And again, buying time was more likely to elevate mood and alleviate anxiety. But these findings may be hard for some people to, well, buy. Even in a sample of 850 millionaires, just over half of our respondents spent money to buy themselves time. These findings link to a broader literature suggesting that we do not always spend money in ways that promote happiness. Even when we should know better. Personally, I know that when I recently moved to a new city, I had a lot of errands to run. I had to let my own data convince me that buying time would make my life easier, less stressful, and happier. For Scientific Americans, 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. Perhaps the chief poster child of antibiotic resistance is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA. The bacterium is impervious to a suite of antibiotics, and it can cause blood infections, pneumonia, even death. And you'd assume that it developed its namesake resistance to methicillin by being exposed to methicillin. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Instead, the culprit for resistance appears to be an earlier and chemically related antibiotic, penicillin. We think it's a very early use of penicillin that was around that then forced the the strains to pick up these mechanisms. Matthew Holden, a molecular microbiologist at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Holden and his team analyzed the genomes of freeze-dried strains of MRSA bacteria from the 1960s to the 80s. In effect, what we were doing was sort of genomic archaeology in in looking at the genomes and, and comparing the variation and using that information to So effectively, you reconstruct the evolutionary history as... What they found was that the staph bacteria seemed to have acquired the methicillin resistance gene in the mid-1940s, about 15 years before methicillin even hit the market. And they determined that it was the widespread use of penicillin that led to that adaptation. The results are in the journal Genome Biology. Methicillin was introduced in the UK in 1959. Less than a year later, resistance was first reported. Resistance that it appears now was already baked into those staph strains. Looking ahead, Holden says we'd do well to vigilantly monitor the genetics of circulating strains, to find out which bugs may already be armed to battle our newest antibiotics as soon as they're developed. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Songbirds produce a rich repertoire of sounds. Songs, of course, but also chatter calls, flight calls, and alarm calls, like this high-pitched warning from a black-capped chickadee. But chickadees aren't the only ones endowed with chirping abilities. Turns out a certain type of caterpillar can too. Once again, here's the bird and then the caterpillar. Sounds pretty darn similar. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Jessica Lindsay is a biologist at the University of Washington. She says this species, the North American walnut sphinx caterpillar, makes the sound using tiny pairs of breathing holes called spiracles. They compress themselves lengthwise like an accordion. And so that compression pushes air out of that spiracle, um, making whistling sounds. A cool coincidence for sure. But here's where it gets interesting. Lindsay then played the caterpillar whistle through a speaker near a bird feeder. And the birds, of many different species, ducked for cover. Sometimes we would see little nut hatches flicking their wings, and that's a big signal of distress for them. And sometimes it would take a really long time to return to feeding, which is a big indicator that they were taking that whistling noise pretty seriously. And whereas the birds were unperturbed by the song of a house finch, the control sound, they responded to the caterpillar whistles with almost the same urgency as when they heard that real alarm call from a chickadee suggesting the caterpillars are onto something. So they're basically using bird speak to say that there is a dangerous predator in the area and that the birds better get into cover. 
Lindsay presented the results at the International Symposium on Acoustic Communication by Animals in Omaha. Previous work suggests the caterpillars whistle when pecked at by birds, and they sometimes squeal too, suggesting they may have more than one scare tactic to worm their way out of trouble. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. What does panic sound like? <coughs> like that for sure, but also like this. And this. But maybe you already knew that, because a new study shows that humans are actually good at identifying vocalizations that are emotionally intense, even when those outcries come from other species. The findings are communicated in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. It was Charles Darwin who first mused about the evolution of emotional expression. As he wrote in The Descent of Man, All the air-breathing vertebrata necessarily possess an apparatus for inhaling and expelling air. When the primeval members of this class were strongly excited and their muscles violently contracted, purposeless sounds would almost certainly have been produced. Now, if producing those seemingly purposeless noises turned out to be beneficial, by warning others of predators, summoning protection, or enticing a mate, the behavior would persist and over time become selected for. Of course, for that to happen, the meanings behind those utterances would have to be clearly understood. To explore this question, researchers asked 75 volunteers to listen to vocalizations produced by nine different species, from black-capped chickadees to American alligators. The recordings included sounds made by animals when they were relatively relaxed, like this hourglass tree frog, or in some way excited say, reacting to an aggressor or competing for a mate, like this hourglass tree frog. The listeners were then asked to identify which of the paired recordings from each species represented a sound of distress or emotional arousal. The result? We found that, yes, humans recognize higher levels of emotional intensity in species which span across all of these classes. Pieta Filippi of the University of aix marseille in France and the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in the Netherlands, who led the study. Interestingly, we did not find any effect of language background on humans' accuracy. Participants who spoke English, German, or Mandarin all did equally well at pointing out which chirps, squeals, and hoots were emotionally charged. They were also able to tell when actors speaking in Tamil, a language none of them had ever heard before, sounded upset. This finding does suggest that humans' ability to recognize higher levels of emotional intensity in animal vocalizations is biologically universal. The listeners seem to be tuning in on the higher frequency of alarm calls, the researchers say. These shifts in pitch are perhaps clearest in the vocalization of infants, such as the piglet used in this study. And that suggests we may be hardwired to recognize babies in distress. Well, we're not necessarily horse whisperers, but it seems we all feel for that little piggy when it goes to make its emotions known. For Scientific Americans, 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkins.